Um, I'm not being in, but given we have two Jamies, uh, we'll have, this one's JP, that one's Jamie, if that's all right. Um, not a question I think I've ever asked either of you, and I've interviewed you both a, a fair few times, but we'll start with Jamie. Um, where did it all begin? When did you first start playing rugby league? Um, I started playing rugby league when I moved in next door to two rugby league players um, called Andrew and Dean Basto. And to be honest with you, I was about seven years old then. And uh, I didn't really like rugby. I'd never played rugby, didn't know anything about it. To be honest with you, I liked football. And um, they were the biggest kids in the street, so they decided what we played. Um, and I, <laughs> I got an involuntary education in, uh, in rugby league. And it was one of them where, obviously, I used to play football and uh, we used to line up on the wall and you'd give each other names. And uh, same with rugby, but I didn't know any rugby players were. And they said, you've got two choices. You can be Martin Fire or Ellery Hanley. <laughs> and uh, I said, are they good players? They said, yeah, yeah, they're great players. And I thought that's why they used to give me those two choices. But whenever we played uh, football, they always had to be uh, John Barnes. So I uh, had a good idea what they looked like. But that, they, those two guys played at, um, at Stanningley. Um, and that's my first amateur club. Uh, I started playing rugby league, obviously, on, my, on the pitch, the grass. We had a big patch of grass outside our house. So I had the opportunity and the environment to play. Uh, and then one day at Bramley CAV, which was from my primary school, a guy called Brian Souden, who I'm sure has been influential with both, uh, James here, and uh, he was doing an after-school coaching session. Saw that I could play a bit of rugby, I was quite big. He invited me along to Stanley that weekend. He said, bring your boots, lads, Saturday morning. Took them with me and never looked back. I loved it to bits and uh, just a great opportunity to get a, uh, in a club with some great friends and play a great game. When did you realise that you weren't too bad at it either? Well, it's funny, I had a testimony in 2009, and uh, incidentally, the same year, JP had his last testimony. He gets one every three years, uh, <laughs> for some reason. Uh, he's having a testimonial next year for his uh, contribution to testimonial. <laughs> um, basically, um, when I was a kid, I was born in August, so there's this relative age effect that JP used to, he flagged it up, really. I was youngest in the year, so technically a lot of kids, when I go coaching now, the, the youngest in the years are the smallest. I was just that big and strong, and I see it in my boys now. My, I've got four boys, my oldest two, Laura and Dax. Um, it's embarrassing what they do on sports day. They're just that good, they're that athletic, that sporting. Uh, the second one in particular, Dax, he's, he'll beat everybody in his year and in year above. In fact, last sports day, they come home, and I think they had five firsts and two seconds. And uh, I sat him down, so I was quite disappointed with seconds. <laughs> and uh, I said, what's going on here, lads? And to be fair, the reason why they've got one at seconds is because we're both at the same race. Um, <laughs> so one of them had to get a second. Uh, and the other one was, because my oldest one, Laura, he's in a race, and it, it must have only been 20 metres apart, and there was a, a bowl full of water. Great, great um, activity made up by teachers. And there was another bowl full of water, and the kids had to line up. What they had to do was get the, fill the cup up with water, run to other bowl and fill that up, come back and just keep filling it up with water, and whoever got the most in the jug at the end won. But to make it a little bit harder, teachers put holes in all the bottom of all the cups, so my lad sets off and he's got it and he's running down he's going, Dad, Dad, there's an hole in this one. And he puts it in I'm, I'm off and says, there's supposed to be an hole in it. But he was that concerned with winning. He won't listen. He's, Dad, Dad. And he threw this cup, went and got another one. And he's, there's an hole in this one as well. <laughs> he ended up uh, finishing second in that because he was too busy at morning. Um, <laughs> about that, which shows the competitiveness. And I, I was very similar. So um, any sport that I played, you know, whether it be throwing wellies in sports, they playing rounders, I wanted to hit it out of the ground. Um, and I just knew that if I was on, if people knew that if I was on their team, I was probably going to win in primary school anyway. Uh, and that's how a lot of met a lot of my friends. So regardless of what game I played, football, and it really helped in classroom as well. I wanted to, if I did a maths test, I wanted to be in it top. Whenever a name or a list was written out, I wanted to have my name in it top. So I knew if I could do that, or at the time I thought quite in an idolatrous kind of way, really, bad, really, when I look and I got older, some of the things I've done getting older, trying to win. Um, Jamie might tell you about later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you know, we, we have to do wrestling in training all the time. And uh, when Jones is in there, it's like an intensity bomb's been dropped in there. and It feels like um, he's fighting for his life rather than we're just practicing <laughs> training. And we come away with um, gouged eyes and uh, <laughs> fingers broken. One of the things I ever did was in wrestling. Um, I still feel bad about it. Now, Kyle Lula, like strongest bloke you're ever going to come across. Um, he used to bench press 200 kgs with these. Uh, he's getting older now. He doesn't do, try as hard. He never really tried that hard, to be honest with you. <laughs> but he likes to win as well in, in wrestling. And he once got me and I couldn't move. And uh, I didn't matter what I did, I couldn't move. And my face was right next to him. And I thought, I need to make him react here. Um, by, I don't know, I need to put him off so I can move and try and get him. 
and I like did this little spit, like, pff, like I, and I know it's awful, it's disgusting, and uh, he moved, and I got him, and he still dominated me, he still beat me, and then afterwards, he said, you just spit at me? I went, oh, mate, I am so sorry, it's the worst thing I've ever done, I was texting him all night, saying, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I just love playing whatever sport, but um, rugby league is, is one where being big at the time uh, really helps, it's physical, and in, unlike other sports like tennis or football, if somebody gets you, you can get them back fairly later on. <laughs> uh, you can be physical with them, you can rag them about, put a big shot on uh, and get them back. So I've always loved rugby league, I've always stuck with it. Where did you start out? Yeah, but my tail's probably not as long as that. Um, <laughs> 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 I was uh, five years old at school, um, St Stanley Primary, and one of the, the guy, kids I went to school with brought a letter in. Do you want to come down and play for the same club as Jamie Jones, Stanley? It's a 10p a week to come down and play. And uh, I took the letter on to my dad, asked, you know, can I play? And he, he took me down there and I just got the, the love from the game from then. I, I played it with Andy Basto, one of the lads he's talking with. He, he played in the same age group as, uh, as me and I, I can agree with Jonesy, he was a big lad too as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how I started, pretty simple and started the same club and loved the game from a five-year-old. Your journey was a little trickier though, wasn't it? I mean, you ended up having to go down under to, to make the grade, so to speak. Yeah, I've got a weird old journey to the top, really, I suppose. You know, to end up going on on Captain England, I think. Uh, I, I was probably a bit, I was a bit of a tear away as a, as a young lad. Um, you know, I used to get into a, a few scrapes and a bit of trouble, and I stopped playing when I was 14. Uh, a firework went off on my foot, um, burnt <laughs> on my foot, like you do when you're 14, and, and I quit playing for about a year. Then I came back uh, at 16, started playing again. And not all the lads normally get signed at 16 years old. You, you got signed at 16. and I didn't get signed up with all the players who were the same age as me, the, the peers who were 16 years old. But I kept playing because I, I liked playing. I liked playing with Stanley. I liked playing with my teammates. And, uh, so I played for the under-18s at Stanley and I played for the Open Age team as well. But then, when I was 17 years old, um, something miraculous happened. I got contact lenses. <laughs> all right. So I'm incredibly short-sighted. Um, you know, Going back, if you sat in the front row then, I won't be able to see what your facial expression was. So I got a contact lens and I saw who to run into and who not to run into <laughs> when I was 17. And then probably about six months after I got contact lenses, I got signed. Um, sorry, Wakefield Trinity came down actually and watched me play. And uh, they asked me to go for a trial with them. And I'd left school, I was working, so I went for a trial with Wakefield Trinity. Had two games with them and one of them was against Bradford, the team I ended up signing for. And they asked me, do you want to sign and go with us? And, the, the money they offered was probably 10% of what I was earning um, as, a, as a job. So I said, I can't do that. I can't leave it for that. So I, I kept uh, playing again. And then Bradford Bulls came down and watched me and they said, do you want to come for a trial uh, with the academy? So I agreed, went up and trialed with the academy. And I trialed for 13 weeks for them before they offered me a contract. Uh, <laughs> so 13 weeks I had to play for them um, while I was working. And then they offered me a contract. It was, I had to leave my job. It was half what I was getting paid. But I thought, you know what, I don't want one of these guys in a pub four years down the line saying I, I could be one of these on the TV. So I decided to make the leap of faith and uh, left work and signed for the Bradford Bulls. But then I signed for the Bradford Bulls and, and even then was a tricky journey to the top. I, I, uh, as Tanya said, I went to Australia. What happened was, in, um, that was in 1996, played for the academy. In 97, played for the air team. And in the beginning of 1998, Matty Elliott was a coach. He said to me, you're not quite ready to play first team for the Bradford Bulls. So I went, OK, fair enough. He goes, you can go two places this year on loan. You can either go to Dewsbury or you can go to Sydney in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so five minutes later, um, <laughs> I've decided to go to Sydney. Um, and I go to Sydney, but Sydney didn't work out for me. It was pretty tough in uh, Sydney. I was out there seven months. And there's a guy out there, Greg Mackey, who's just recently passed away. He, he coached... Uh, he, sorry, he played at Hull, played at Warrington, he coached me out there. And me and him clashed all the time. But what he was trying to install in me was that, like um, the mental side of the game, the mental toughness side of the game, um, looking back on it now. So I was out there seven months, but my job fell through when I got out there. I was supposed to work with this building company. That company went bust, right? So I was skint. I had no money. I was living on people's floors, uh, someone's front room floor. And um, I was that skint. I was living on noodles, you know, noodles that you get five days a week. Those super noodles, and if you're eating them five days a week, they're not that super, honestly. <laughs> so I was there like seven months, and then I come back from Australia. Matt Elliott, the coach, said to me, you know, he says, uh, we're not sure where we want to keep you after all, all I've been through, you know, after all they promised me. He said he'd ring me every, every week. He rung me twice in seven months when I was out there. So I've got back, and he put me on loan at Featherstone. I made, played four games for Featherstone. 
then came back again and he said, oh, I spoke to the board, we're not going to keep you, we're, we're going to let you go. So I was de absolutely devastated, I thought, wow, I've been through all this and, and you're just going to cut me like this. So I spoke to Brian Noble, um, who was the assistant coach, and he went and spoke to the board because he had a long history of being at the Bradford Bulls. And they said, we'll give you a contract one more year. And so then I thought, right, this is it. The, the, I am in the last chance saloon here. And I never trained so hard in, in all my life. And uh, I had to win 13 man of matches in a row for the, for the A team before I got picked in the first team. And then finally made my debut in, in 99. So in the end, I probably spoke as long as you, Jones, are there. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's my tail in getting to the first team. <clears throat> Do you think the hardship that you went through, that whole journey, created who, the, the player that you have become? Yeah, I, I believe, I've heard Richard Branson say it recently, there's no such, thing as, no such thing as failure. I don't believe there is, um, as long as you learn something out of it. And I think all the hardships I, I had along the way and all, all the knockbacks and all the setbacks just put me, it, it just made me more determined and, and it, uh, allowed me, developed a skill set to be able to deal, deal with upset and deal with... Um, not getting your way, you know, we, we have a lot of problem with, uh, just going on a different subject, we have a lot of problem with the, the, the really good kids who come through is because they've never been said no. You know, we get them come through, best player at 15s, best player at 16s, best player at 17s, getting first team, 25th best player, probably 200th best player in the country. And when they get told no, you're not in the team, they can't handle it because they've not developed the skill set through the three or four years building up into that to be able to deal with setbacks and losses. and. Uh, I'm eternally grateful now for, for the grounding that it gave me and that ability, to, my bounce back ability, um, to get back and get on with things. So you had a relatively straightforward journey, mm. didn't you, when, once you actually got within a club? Yeah, um, yeah, I guess so. Um, I did okay until I got to about 15. Signed for Leeds when I was 15. And then I think my, my tough journey, the delayed gratification, if you like, was uh, when I was 18 and I got a really bad groin injury. And um, basically, I, I pulled the uh, long adductor off my pelvis and it pulled some bone off as well. And it was really odd. I don't know how I did it, but when, when I went and did the, the scans of the MRIs, it said <coughs> it was don't like. Go into too much detail. <laughs> 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 so it was like when a, a, motor, a motorcyclist has a crash and slides up the petrol tank, my hip had come right away. Um, it was probably from too many squats and too much weights so that we were doing at the time. Um, and I had the best part of two years, I had two hernia operations on my abdominals and my groin. Um, and I went from. That person that JP is uh, talking about there, that has a lot of yeses, to somebody who just couldn't even get out on the field. Uh, and at the time, I thought, I'm going to have to retire, just go home, just cry my eyes out, I think the journey's finished here before it's even started. Um, but I was really lucky at the time, I had a coach called Dean Bell, who was an unbelievable coach, he was all about mental toughness. I had a great club in the Rhinos and Gary, who would give me every chance, give me every medical opportunity to get back right. Uh, and through that chance, by God's grace, I managed to just keep working hard and, and really put myself in. I remember being at, at times when I was studying at shower thinking, contract runs out next year, it has to happen, you know, I've got to get fit, I've got to do all my rehab, I've got to get as strong as I can. I was never as quick or as agile, um, and I turned into a bit of a grafter, which was fair enough, but I just had to make it happen. And I think, you know, I've learned a lot from JP, you can see his mental toughness in, in his games, um, you know, the carries that he takes. Tackles that he makes, it's phenomenal. And uh, you know, he takes his carries, he takes about a quarter of mine as well. Um, I always have to chase around pitch, but I've just heard a stat downstairs, uh, if you don't mind me telling him. Um, that in his time at Leeds, he's had enough carries to get him from here to Wembley, from Leeds to Wembley. <laughs> It's a fair old uh, that's a I wish I'd known that one for last night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, we'll remember uh, that for the opening, opening <laughs> show. Um, <laughs> my carries are just passing Sheffield. Um, <laughs> but I think the difference between me and Jamie is um, he sent me a quote not too long ago. I think it was George Bernard Shaw, was it? Yeah. Talked about the unreasonable man and uh, forcing an environment to suit you. So if it's not working for you, you've got to make it happen. I've always been uh, a little bit different in, in that I'm a little bit more passive. I um, saw one in a Bruce Lee book that talked about, Bruce Lee talked about being like water. Um, water can fit in any vessel. Uh, one of the analogies I give to kids is, is uh, I'm a bit like a goldfish. You know, if you've ever had a goldfish, Got the reason why they have goldfish in fairgrounds because they live forever in black, little plastic bags, and you can put them in a, in a warm tank, cold tank. You know, kids can take them out. I once had a goldfish. I'm watching a film, <laughs> and uh, it jumped out. Uh, it was in my bedroom. It jumped out on the floor, and I've looked at it. I thought, I says to my girlfriend, I said, um, I says, "That's goldfish on the floor there." And I thought, uh, I must have rolled over it because it looked dead flat. It was covered in like carpet, and I thought, I'll put it back. I'll, when it, it's obviously dead, I'll, I'll sort it out when it's finished film. And I finished this film, not honestly, I know it sounds pretty cruel. 
And afterwards, I went and picked it up and it just started jiggling about, put it back in the tank, still alive. Like, absolutely resilient. Um, and, and for me, no matter what coach I've been in, like, what team I've been in, I've always tried to, whatever environment I've had, to try and fit myself around that and uh, work out that I can get ahead. But when I talk to young kids, you know, I talk about that, that delayed gratification, that if you're not willing to make sacrifices, to make the tough decisions in life, uh, and be willing to work hard for something that's not going to reward you straight away. You know, they're all playing on the phones on Candy Crush now, and everybody wants that, that sugar, whether it be uh, eating sugar or that mental sugar in their mind. They want that instant gratification, but the things that are really worthwhile take uh, a long time uh, to come. Could you pop round to my house and just have a chat with a teenage son for an hour or so? Can I? Yeah, I'm trying. Um, we'll get to the, the Leeds Academy and the group that's come through, but the Bradford team you were in under Brian Noble was a pretty special time as well, wasn't it? I mean, what made that group a special group, do you think? Um, I, I think there was a good mix. Of, I think any good team is a good mix of different characters. I think if you're all the same, it doesn't work. Uh, I think that's in any environment. And I think at the time at Bradford, we, we had a, a good core of... Um, Players which which Jones used the word which are grafters which their game was based around working hard, doing all the little extras, training harder than anybody else, playing harder than everybody else, and they perhaps weren't the prettiest players to watch, but the the ones as a player you come through you admired the most, and then you'd have your show players like uh, Robbie Paul, uh, <laughs> Leslie Vinicola, Shantae Arp, Leon Price, the players who could break games open, and um, we had a really good mix between those two, and I think I feel part of my grounding. I was very fortunate to come through with. The, these hard-nosed professionals that have come from. Um, I, I talk like Brian McDermott, our coach, Jimmy Lowe's, uh, Bernard Dwyer, Mike Forshaw. They, they made the transition probably from a, a blue-collar job where you, you had to work as hard as you possibly could to becoming a full-time professional, and they brought that work ethic with them in, in, into the sport, and it was easy for me to see that. So an example would be Bernard Dwyer. Um, if he'd, he didn't play like... More, if he played less than 60 minutes, the first thing he would be... You'd see him at 7 o'clock Monday morning, in an hour before everybody else, on a rowing machine, um, trying to train as hard as he could, trying to make himself as fit as he possibly could. And for me, that was a great grounding of what it takes to become a professional player. And I think uh, because of all that, we, we ended up winning quite a lot of stuff at Bradford. I was very fortunate to be a, a, a good club full of good people. Where do you get, though, that, that winning mentality? How do you get a team on a roll? Because you picked up an immense amount of silverware in, in the same way that Leeds have gone on to do, do sort of afterwards. I think a winning, a winning mentality is just a lot of smaller... I think, for me, it's a lot of small areas. That you've got to have people that want to beat everybody else, like Jones. You, you want to be the best at what you want to do. You want to beat everybody else. You want to beat everybody in your team. You want to beat your teammates. And I think the more people you have in your team like that, it creates a... It creates a a really competitive environment and creates a team that's competitive that won't, won't lose and refuses to lose. And I think just moving on from the Bradford one to the Leeds one, I think we became quite renowned for winning a lot of games late on in, in games because we had that competitive element. There were probably eight or nine of us who just refused to lose. We would just, it just would not be in our radar to want to lose. We would want to win. I think that's a crucial part of it. I think the self-sacrifice, going, going above and beyond what you're asked to do. Um, you know, I, I think the saying comes out of the Leeds club, which was the same at Bradford, is that you probably spend 25 hours a week training, you know, at the club. But for me, a rugby league player, it's 24-7, 365 days a year. It's, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. And to lead the lifestyle of a successful rugby league player means a lot of self-sacrifice away from the sport and making the right decisions. And one of my favourite sayings for me is that if someone's not pissed off with me, in, in, my, uh, in my local circle of people around me, like my family and friends, that I'm probably not being the best rugby league player. And that's something I've got used to and learned to have thick skin over the years. And I always tell them, you know, I'll, I'll be finished playing soon, I'll be finished playing soon. And 20 years later, I keep saying that to them. So <laughs> they're pretty angry with it. So basically self-sacrifice and, and hard work are the two, two things I, I think are key for any team that wants to go out and win. What for you is it like coming through with a group of players that's come through that academy? What was the atmosphere like? Uh, it was brilliant. Um, I think going back to when I was in the academy with Dean Bell, I think that was probably yeah, the time when a lot of the guys who've really come to fruition, this nucleus, um, this core, if you like myself, Kev Sinfield, obviously Ryan Bailey just gone, Danny Maguire, Rob Burrow, and there's a lot we're going to meet a lot tomorrow night. You know, Calderwood and Chev Walker, and, uh, Danny Ward at the reunion that we're having, uh, the Civic Hall, and you know, for me, I, had that, I went through that injury period, so I was one of the older ones, a bit like Kev Sinfield. And uh, you know we were like that from being 12 years old, like my best friend. 
Um, and just in terms of, I was being a bit like, um, I was describing myself a bit of a pirate. I was trying to take the best bits out of everybody. Um, you know, if, if I want to do some speed and agility, you do it with Rob Burrow. If you want to do some strength work, you do it with Kylie. But Kevin Timfield, out of all the people I've ever come across in my life, is probably the one person that I've assimilated most from, um, most knowledge, most experience, because he's the most professional human being I'd ever come across, and obviously very, very close. So I was looking, I was looking, you know, I think sometimes when you read books about successful people, Steve Jobs or um, uh, anybody really, they talk about coming through at a special time and having some really fortunate experiences, and I was the same. We had Graham Murray, who'd almost laid the path, the foundations, if you like. He'd build this team overnight with Yestin Harris and Adrian Morley in 98, 99, that, I had glimpses of being really successful, so as a club, uh, me being in a lead rhino spot all my life as well, uh, as a club we started to see that there's some success growing. And then Gary Ethan and Cone put this uh, youth system in place, um, really believed in, in the youth that we had in the local area um, and, and brought us through. And we all got our opportunities, uh, some sooner than others. I had to wait that extra two years because of the injury. Uh, but when I come through, um, you know, it's been a, a, an unbelievable journey. You know, some something that I've learned, particularly after winning that this year, is the old Winston Churchill quote, success is never final, defeat is never fatal, it's, it's a career to continue that counts. And every year we've learned something new from each coach, with Tony Smith, Abraham McLennan, uh, Abraham McDermott. And uh, I sat down in Jacksonville last week and we watched a video that's coming out <coughs> really soon of the golden decade, the, the last 10 years. And I had to pinch myself watching it, it was like just unbelievable. I, I, I'm thinking, I can't believe I've been a part of that. It's like, you know, when you watch documentaries on astronauts that like go to the moon and stuff like that, this group of people have this really special experience, you think, wow, it'd be great to be a part of that. That's how I felt looking back. And uh, I guess because I'm still living it in a, in a way, uh, I won't fully appreciate it yet until maybe it's 10, 20 years time, 30 years time at a reunion when I'm sat around with Rob Burrow, you know, whose, whose nose will carry on growing and his, <laughs> his ears will get bigger and his head will get smaller. Um, like little Gollum. And, um, <laughs> And I sit with those guys and I look back and think, wow, you know, what, how special is that that I've uh, been a part of? Every, every little bit of it's been uh, a learning journey. We've learned something new every time, but I don't think you ever, you ever get fed up of winning. And obviously, hopefully, God willing, I'll have two more years left and, uh, at least. And I want to get a few more in there. What would you say about you? Well, you probably heard when you're not here. <laughs> He well, says that about I'm just Rob. thinking, I, I think Robbie, Robbie looks more like Dobby out of Harry Potter than Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. No, I, I agree with him. It's been, you know, the, I watched that same, um, the same 40 minute uh, documentary that they put together and it was just an unbelievable watch to sit there and watch it. And, uh, but I felt a bit, do you know what? I felt a bit, um, what's the word, dirty watching it because I thought, I don't want to, I don't want to sit in my achievements just right now. I don't want to sit here and, watch it all because there's a bit more to go yet. I think, I'd like, I think I'll enjoy it more when I've I finished uh, playing because I sat there thinking, it's good this, but th th these chapters still unwritten here and uh, I, I want to keep writing more chapters. That keeps John, my producer, in work anyway, yeah. so he'll be delighted to hear that. Um, for you, obviously, you made the decision <coughs> to leave Bradford uh, and come to Leeds. Was that a tough decision or was it a, a no-brainer for you? No, it was, it was an incredible, difficult decision decision I was captain um, of the, the Bulls in my last season in 2005. I, I always wanted to come and play for my hometown club. I supported from the South Stand uh, when, I, when I was uh, a lot younger, from four to probably 14, used to come and watch. And I saw what was going on at the Rhino. Something exciting was happening with the players Jonesy was on about coming through under Tony Smith, a lot of young English players. And I thought this would be a good team, good team chance to go over and play for a good team. Uh, you know, you want to play for your... your um, your hometown club, but I think everyone has dreams to do that. But you want to play for a good hometown club, and I think that was that made the decision easier. So you're not supposed to sign till September, like 2005. But February 2005, I was a Leeds Rhinos player, which brought its own difficulties throughout the year. I, I, I had to tell a few of the boys at the Bradford Bulls, you know, I'm not sure what I'm doing, I'm not sure what I'm doing. And then one night out, we we had the night out um, after a game, I think in May, and I said, listen, I'm leaving. You know, to a few of them, I said. I my mind, made my mind up, I don't, I'm sorry to leave you all, but I want to go play for my own town club. I'd been tripped poorly by some of the, the, the management of the Bulls and it's time for me to go. But that ended up being like a catalyst and or like the dominoes started falling because after that, I think about six or seven or eight players, I went, well, we're talking with other clubs, we're, we're all going then now. Um, but I, I finished in the right way, I feel, feel at the Bradford Bulls, you know, the, won the grand finals, the last thing I did, did for them. What was it like when he came and joined you then? 
Yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, I'd not really known much about Jamie. I'd not met him before. Um, I'd heard a lot about him. We both have got a lot of similarities. We obviously both called Jamie. both grew up in Bramley. We even lived in the same street for a while. Um, he moved out before I got there. Both played at the same uh, amateur club. Uh, both really good looking, obviously. I've uh, got a lot of similarities. Uh, I'd never met him and um, I'd, I'd played against him. And uh, wow, I just remember how tough he was. Um, his, his upper body strength, like torso, he couldn't, I always wanted to dominate, try and dominate him as well. Uh, obviously, both of us standing I know people from standing they'd be watching. And I could never get him on his back. He just would not finish on his back. Um, so when you get somebody like Jamie Peacock, um, you know, being the international lad, he's coming to play for, for Leeds, it's just a massive strengthener, a big, big bolster. And, um, I, JP, you know, you're talking about Kev Sinfield uh, and some of the other inspirational people we've got in our team. <coughs> I, I think you've just heard there why he's such an inspirational person because he picks things out of the air, picks uh, things out of books, shares it with us and says, you know, have a look at this. Um, this will get us through next week, the next year, the next few months. And, uh, you know, uh, Kev Sinfield right up there um, for one of the reasons why we've won so many much silverware, but certainly JP is too. Grand Finals World Club it became the norm, quite frankly, Leeds winning. Now I almost got bored doing the montages myself. This, though, was the one that kept eluding you. Um, you'd won it with Bradford. Yeah. You'd obviously not with Leeds. When you talk about the adversity, about believing in yourselves, do you think that's what you had to do last season? We, I remember doing... Was it the St Helens Gate? Well, I remember talking to Brian McDermott, who doesn't, he doesn't generally give mass I mean, he's very honest he's very he's, he's fascinating to interview but he said after the game he said the guys were really nervous going into this one and it's not so I, I was really taken aback that he said it to me it clearly meant and had meant for a long time but last season just seemed to mean even more to you lot so how did you go on and win it uh, well I, I, Brian is right we were nervous on the bus going there I, I felt that you know I've been here before so I, I, I think a good, you, when people are nervous on a bus, it's not a good sign. So I started taking a piss out of some of the supporters who were walking past because I just thought, we need to break, break this now. You know, you can't be nervous going into this game. We need to be... So for the last, like, I remember on the coach train of getting up and thinking, this, this, is too, this is too nervous, this. So I thought I'd get up and try and break this up a little bit. I think, for me, I think from the performances, I, I think the confidence came from the performances and the... There's loads of factors going in there. I think we had such a clear game plan from Brian Mack that everyone bought into in the, in the big games that we had to win against St. Helens, against Warrington and against Castleford. The, the game plan was so clear and we had that much clarity and I think the boys were just determined to do it. I think they were, especially the guys who'd lost it a few times, I'm sure Jones will say, were that determined to do it. It, it, it reminded a lot for me for a, a guy who come back to Bernard Dwyer again. Bernard Dwyer once spoke... Um, before a season and he'd lost the Challenge Cup four times and he spoke in front of everybody and, and he, this is a tough like working class bloke and he, he had not much emotion and, and just tell you how it is and, and he was in tears because he, he said I'm not having another one of these losers medals I'm not having one he threw them all in the bin in front of him and says these can stay here in Lanzarote right and that year we won the Challenge Cup and, and it was his last season, he ended up retiring after the Challenge Cup and I thought that's the determination I saw in him that I, I kind of saw in the lads that had lost it a few times before and I think that's the reason why we went out there and won it. It's interesting, I've, I've never heard that story before yeah. about the medals but every, I've lost four as well, I had done going up into that and um, every time I got a loser's medal I used to tape it up in black insulation tape and I'd put it outside the trophy cabinet, it never went in. I never threw them away, I just kept them there as reminders. Obviously, you go away from a game like that and you want to remember how much it hurts and use that as motivation, as energy to get back there and, and win it next time. But um, I think JP vouched for me that whether I'm playing in the Challenge Cup final, Grand Final, World Cup Challenge or I'm playing out here on Boxing Day, I've got to win. I've got to win every game. It makes the, what event it is makes the difference. <coughs> I can play a final for Leeds on Stanley Park and it won't make any difference. I've just got, I've got to go out there and win. And for me, I've always been one who tries to turn everything into positives and I was always fascinated by the fact we've won all these grand finals and chuffed to bits with that. World Cup Challenge has been the, beating the best in the world but never won a Challenge Cup. And I say it on this video that um, you know, if my life, my rugby league life, had been like a big jigsaw, not winning the Challenge Cup would have been like a missing piece in the middle. And if you went and saw a great jigsaw on the wall and there's one piece missing, that would be the most interesting piece, funnily enough. Be able to tell all kinds of stories about how uh, I've played in this great team, but just never able to win at three o'clock on a, on a Sunday afternoon when everybody else in Europe's having a siesta. You know, we, we always play our games on a eight o'clock on a, on a Friday night. Uh, just couldn't do it. But this particular day, like JP said, um, 
but went in with a really special game plan. You know, Brian McDermott absolutely nailed it all the way through. And I think we tried to play like Leeds in all the other Challenge Cup finals this time. We played a little bit more boring. People said we played boring, but you never get bored of winning. We didn't care how we played. We just wanted to win that cup. And went across. Um, lads executed the semi and the final as best as I've, as good as I've ever seen in a lead shirt. Um, when we got the just desserts for it. And what what was it like winning it the oh. way home? The the realisation of finally getting it for you. Yeah, it was. I mean, there's a few pictures. I'm on my knees. All lads are just jumping up and down, and I'm just on my knees, like just giving thanks. And I, I remember running up them stairs. It's like being a 12 year old. It's like being a kid. Um, at school, just high five and everybody. Like I think Kevin Sinfield mentions it in the video. It's a, a long walk when you've lost, and a lot of people commiserating you on the way down, and then you've got to stand at the bottom and watch the winners lift it. And uh, when you've been on a journey and then got to a big place like uh, Wembley, especially. And, and, and Wembley, the funny thing about Wembley is, if you don't win, it costs you more money than, than what it you know, to get there. Because <laughs> you, when you got Wembley, your wife wants a new dress, she wants to do her hair, she wants to do her nails. <laughs> Uh, kids have got to have Jones Buchanan cut inside of their head. Um, it costs you a fortune if you go, honestly. If you, yeah, like, if, we, you don't need to go, you know these uh, Gene websites, Family Tree, you don't need to go on them. You just get to Wembley and your family will all come out yeah, that you've yeah, never yeah. seen for ages before anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Danny Maguire, kit, Danny Maguire all the 42 tickets. Um, and it all comes out of our wages and we've got to go around Leeds trying to get it back. <laughs> Nobody wants to pay you when you've lost. Um, and it's a nightmare. So <laughs> for all these little reasons, you know, it, was, it, was, it was brilliant to win. I remember getting up there and there was people like Gary Schofield and uh, JP's best mate. And, um, mate, he shook my hand that day, so <laughs> it must is, have meant a lot to him. Um, and a few other people and <laughs> just one of the best moments. But like, like I said, uh, was, I could put that, that jigsaw piece in the middle, but you know, it, it's been an interesting journey. Nobody's really bothered now, the fact we won that, apart from the group of people who won it and obviously a few Leeds fans. Uh, what's important is, is that we go out and try and win it again. And that's what I realised, you know, success is, is, is never final. You've just got to keep working hard <coughs> and pass on that legacy and those experiences to that next generation. And thankfully, we've got a, a fantastic group of young lads coming into that environment, learning from people like JP and Kev, who uh, hopefully will carry on Leeds, um, winning trophies for a lot of years to come. How important to you... Um, you know, with the Leeds Foundation, with the work that both of you do with kids, I mean, you referee, don't you? Yeah. Um, and stuff like that. How important for you to pass on the messages, to, to pass on your story, and to, to inspire in the way that you were inspired? I think it's huge. I think, I think Edinburgh Stadium and Leeds Rhinos, Leeds Rugby, in fact, uh, and the Leeds Rugby Foundation, they're, they're like a hub for people, not just sports people and rugby players, uh, but for all people of ages and abilities and be students to come up here uh, and be everything that they can be. And I think that's what all anybody can ever want to do. Uh, and I've, I've said it a million times before, I think everybody's a bit like a superhero. Um, they've all got special power with them. With mine, it, it, with me, it's persistence. You know, when, it, it's, uh, when it's going well, if it goes wrong, it's stubbornness. And, you know, stubborn. uh, and what we've got to do is in, encourage people to come and be all they can be and feed that back to society. Um, now I've said it a million times when I've been speaking for the foundation, it reminds me a bit like uh, reading a book, Dante's Inferno. I was reading about Florence in the in, uh, in 14, 1500s, and all these people were coming out of Florence, you know, Machiavelli and, and Cromwell, uh, T um, Thomas Cromwell. There's all the artists, you know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There was, uh, there was, there was Dante, there's, um, there's, there's all, these, all these different people. I thought, they're all coming out of Florence in this, this one time. And Florence is, I think it's Latin uh, for flourishing the, um, or blossom. And uh, the, the Romans put it there. And it was like this special moment, this special place where these Medici's like Gary Etherton come and they owe all the money. And Gary's like this big tyrant figurehead that, that puts all the money in, in the organisation together. Uh, and all these people have created so much, uh, whether it be art or philosophy, and made a massive influence in and around Europe over the last three, four, five hundred years. And I think Edinley, to me, in my own silly little mind, is very similar. I sit there up in the stand now, and I, uh, I'm there as a, a trustee at Leeds Rugby Foundation, and I see all the kids from amateur clubs, whether it be Stanley, Milford, East Leeds, Ulton, coming up, enjoying, playing on the pitch, watching their heroes, right, being inspired by them. Uh, and, I, and I say that because I'm there with a the father's hat on as well, because my son is on there playing, and I see what, seeing Jamie Peacock and Johnny Wayne, also works for the foundation, all the work that they put into them, what it does for them. We've got all these people who come to support the club from all different backgrounds, from different organisation, 
and just, just bringing everything that they are to the club. And I've just had so much. You know, I always joke Phil Kaplan's in there. I'm from Bramley. I couldn't even read very well when I come to Leeds. And uh, probably 50% of my vocabulary has uh, come from Phil. Just the things and the opportunities that we've had to learn. And so for me, now that I've, I've experienced that, I think it's really important uh, as a professional, while I can, uh, to give back and feed that into the community and make Leeds the, uh, the best city that it can be. And just finally, JP, do you think that's what's made this club in the last 10 years, the, the golden decade, that kind of philosophy? Um, wow. <laughs> I just think the club's been made on good people, really. I think, I think that that's the theme that, for me, thinking about the last 60 minutes or however long we've talked, is that there's been a hell of a lot of good people here. Um, would that be the, 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 the players, all the backroom staff, the coaches, the people who work here? And I think the values that they possess, are certainly the players, I, I think, I think, you know, rugby league, I, I love rugby league because of the values it can give people in life. And I, I don't think many sports are, have that ability to present um, great values. You, you know, look at teamwork, hard work, working hard. And also the, the fact I think many walks of life now, things, things are too easy. Um, it's about taking shortcuts, whereas in rugby league, take a shortcut, you get found out, um, you fail in rugby league. And I think basically human, a lot of human society is set up to take shortcuts. You think of like the car getting vented, emails and all these kind of things are set up to make life easier, whereas rugby league goes against all that. And I think that's why I like it, because it gives you the values that you have to work hard to succeed at anything. And I think with Leeds have been really lucky that over the last 10 years, they've had a lot of players, a lot of public figures that just embrace those values of, of working hard. We haven't had the, I don't think we've had the greatest players. We, we've not had the, the greatest flair players over the last 10 years. We've never won a Man of Steel in the last 10 years. But I think, that, I think that's a bigger compliment for the club than it, than it is a, um, a negative, because I think it's just been built on such a, a great team and, the, and it's, the, the teams are, are more of some of the part than the individuals. It's not been down to some, one flash individual like a rangy chase, it's been built on, on solid people with great values and I think that's the reason why we've been successful over the last few years. It's over to you folks. I think a lot of money corrupts, I think money corrupts people, me. I think it's, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people, if they have a lot of money, you, you end up, people with, it attracts people with, with the wrong, wrong values and wrong ethics. I think you see that in any walk of life. Um, you see that in banking, don't you? A lot of money in banking, there's a lot of people there with you'd say are, are quite immoral. And um, I think the same has happened with the amount of money that's gone into football. I reckon football 30 years ago probably had a lot better family values than it does now. And I think the money's the root cause of that. Are you a bit jealous, though, of how much they earn? I, okay. No, I, it is what it is. And I don't be yeah. one little bit, if I'm honest with you. Don't, don't bother me. I think if people are in a sport um, or a workplace where you can earn a lot of money, then, then you reap what you sow. Um, and they will reap what they sow. We see a lot of footballers getting a lot of money. They don't know what to do with it. Um, they haven't got a clue, but I, th I don't think, not all of them, some of them are, are pretty smart as well. Um, obviously, rugby league players don't tend to be that bothered about money. Um, though JP's just been downstairs and he's just, <laughs> he's just been a ticket off to sign, find out how many he's sold for Sunday. Um, yeah, do you know what that is? Is it six and a half thousand? He said, yeah. if he gets to ten, he's retiring on yeah. Monday. So. <laughs> That's six inches of snow today, but it's just frightened me a little bit. Kyle had otherwise been into, his, into him all day about uh, lads don't want to play if it's snowy. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's panicking. Um, and that bloke in that first letter is right, you do live in a big house. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you used to live in Bromley, then you started earning a few quid, went to Carvely. I'm, st I'm still in Bromley. So I'm just getting on with what I've got. <laughs> Next <laughs> question. I think at the elite level, if you lose that little edge, which we certainly did, I, I fought at the back end, then, then, then you don't win. And I, I think... Um, we got, the focus was such on Wembley. Before we got to Wembley, we lost a few games, and then we came out of that. And I, I think the, the, we nearly beat St Helens with 12 men for 60 minutes. And I think if we'd have got that game, then it had all been totally different. I think, I think now looking back at it now, the fine, there were so many fine margins in, in our results at the back end. If they'd have gone the other way, we could have quite easily won the grand, the final. But we didn't. I think we used our luck in the Challenge Cup. I think. You know, Tom Briscoe keeps all of that ball. I think we go all the way to the grand final then. And I think, you know, the Saints game where we hung on for 60 minutes with uh, 12 men, I think showed how good a side we were still. And I think we dealt with it, but we just like that. That was just that killer instinct for me. I think uh, as well that because of the Challenge Cup, because of what we've been through to get there, it was almost like you had this perception, if we get there, we've done it, whatever it is. And it was like this, this top of this mountain, top, tip of the iceberg. 
and uh, it did a few of us, it probably ruined us a little bit. I think winning it, every, you know, people say, I'm not bothered if you don't win all else if you, as long as we win the Challenge Cup, everybody's really happy. And being Leeds fans as well, and Leeds boys, um, when we won that Challenge Cup, the amount of uh, emotional energy that goes into something like that, uh, coming into it and coming out of it, was phenomenal. And it's the first time I've experienced it as well. Um, and like JP said, if you just lose that 5 10 percent but of that emotional energy that gets burned up, then you're going to struggle. And we just didn't quite have what it took to, to carry on. Um, success does breed success. I think a lot of that success is mentality. I don't think we'll have, I hope we don't have a, a problem next year, but physically and mentally, who believes a game where you've got to be at 90% all the time, otherwise you're just going to get bullied. And uh, we just got bullied a bit that back end. Did it surprise you how much it took out of you? It did surprise me, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, some of the lads, uh, the way they reacted, um, it was brilliant. You know, we were just over the moon with it, and so much fuss got made of it. <clears throat> we talk about celebrating the cup. After when we finished, we got both back to the hotel, and we had a bit of a formal sort of night after <coughs> that. We sort of spoke to sponsors, and it was brilliant. They've been through us all this journey. And then we were back on bus the next day, and I remember it being pretty quick into that next game. You know, the next St. Helens, it was almost like, um, or we'll celebrate this at end of the year type thing, and um, we just we just cracked on. But as I said, I'd, I'd never won a Challenge Cup. It's weird how it's uh, just before the timing is just before the playoffs, and then obviously the grand final as well. It's not uh, an easy time to win something and then carry on as well. We're trying to shift it, honestly. I know, I know. Well, that's it, isn't it? Then I'm talking with BBC scheduling, but we wanted to shift it. <laughs> we want it moved. But when, in the past, whenever we've won something like a grand final, that's it. It's end of the season, we all go off on his holidays. Some lads go off uh, uh, internationals, but that was the end of it. But it, obviously, the Challenge Cup was different. But if we ever get a chance to do it again, we'll, we know now. I think uh, our senior players are really evident, and I, I sit there because I can't get a word in edgeways with JP and, and Kev. Um, they do. I think with any idea in the world, any idea in life, um, an idea is only as good as the amount of people that are buying into it. So if you've, you've got the best idea in the world, if people don't buy into it, then it, it's rubbish because it's not going to get implemented. So you, that, that's key. And Brian McDermott is one of the smartest blokes I've met. He, he understands that he needs his senior players and his whole team to buy into it. So a lot of the ownership on what we do is, is given to the lads as well. What, what do you think? You know, it's not a dictatorship, this is how we're doing it, um, and all doctrinal. You know, a, a lot of our training is based on uh, our coaches giving us the opportunity to say what we think. Obviously, we've got great leaders, uh, JP and, and, and Kev, um, and Danny Mags and, and Rob Burrow, um, and they all put their bit forward, and the lads, the lads buy into it. We've got an unbelievably good culture in, in that regard. I think I, I think that's something that you see throughout sport. I remember reading. I think it was uh, was it Ancelotti when he was in, in charge of Chelsea. He didn't say to the Chelsea team, you know, this is what we're going to win this year. He sat the senior players down and said, right, what do you think we can win this year? Because if they own the goals and they're part of it, then you're twice as likely to succeed than rather than saying, this is what you will do. I found throughout my time that the style of coaching where you get everybody to be on board because they feel it's their idea as well is the one that leads to the most success. I think the teams, obviously every great Britain team I've been involved in has been different from year to year, different individuals and the ability to get those team players to play together, um, that's the skill of being an international coach, I think. Uh, that's the ultimate skill of it. And I think the ones that I've been, that have been the, the closest together have been the ones that have been the most successful. So the ones which have got to four nations finals and been ultimately beat by a better team. Um, you know, I think with Great Britain sometimes you, you do have to know we are the underdog. And when, if we get to a final and beat Australia, it's the underdog beating the, beating the favourite. And I think um, and then the, the one that stands out for me that where we were split was the 2008 World Cup where we were, we were probably split as a team. And uh, you could tell that within the results of, of the team. I think um, Steve McNamara's done a very good job of trying to bring players together with that, right? Setting some. Again, we, we had, after the 2008 World Cup, um, we got together with um, some management people and came up with uh, some values that we thought would be key um, for Great Britain and England going forward because one of the the, uh, the fallout from the 2008 World Cup w was that same reason, that the team wasn't together enough. So we sat down um, at an RAF base and was, was pretty frank. Um, everyone was pretty frank with each other about where the club where it needed to go. We need to create the club environment where you have the ability to be honest with somebody and, and they not take offence with that. And I think 
that's been cleared up over the last few years. I think without that, I think they're probably as close a team as you'll ever get. I thought they were just unlucky in the last series. I thought, you know, they were just unlucky. Sometimes you are in spot, aren't they, unfortunately? Rob, dramatically, yeah, hugely. I think um, we used to be <laughs> trained for just a, too long. You train for two and a half hours at six out of ten or five out of ten, whereas now it's 50 minutes on the field at, at nine and a half out of ten intensity. And I think that's the key area of change has been the introduce, introduction of sports science. I think it's a, a just a hell of a lot more pro professional and concise with what you're doing, rather than like sticking your finger in the air for the, for the wind. You know exactly what you're doing, and it's very scientific. Yeah, I've, I know for me, as I've got, I've always been at the gate. You know, I've just gone in there, fallen in, and last year in particular, every time I did it, I got injured, and muscles were tearing, joints were getting sore, things that I'd never done before, and uh, I had to, I've had to really taper it down now and be a lot smarter with what I eat, you know, how I sleep. Uh, I've talked to JP a lot, obviously, getting to nearly 50 year old is, is uh, how, how do you keep doing it? You know, and he talks about stretching and ice baths. Uh, and as he said, the, the medical work that goes in, every morning when we go in on a, on a morning, we have to do um, a lot of stretching tests. Uh, measure our, we used to measure our grips, um, our flexibility in our ankle and knee joints. And we have to score that all down, the quality of sleep, uh, how we're feeling, as upper body soreness, lower body soreness. And if, if the whole group looks to be down um, on the measurement jump test, then they'll taper training back even more. We're GPS units, so they know exactly how far we're travelling. They know that if we travel uh, above a certain distance in a week, that we're not going to perform well on the weekend because the trend shows we don't. So they'll taper it back at the end. Uh, and they're really smart, right, really, now that we're monitoring that and making sure that we're, we're always at our peak. In fact, we're Who was it who put the GPS on their dog? Leon oh, I don't know. <laughs> Leon, <laughs> Leon, 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 they give him an heart rate monitor to go away and do some work. And, uh, <laughs> he's put it on his dog. <laughs> 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 he went Leon. for a walk. <laughs> I've done that. I've, uh, I've, I've, I've jumped in car and gone home with it, still on. I'm like, done. I'm like 20 odd mile it there. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're looking after us a lot now, it's, and it's really good. And I think that's why you get players playing a bit longer than they used to. It's based around fact, isn't it? Not opinion anymore. You yeah. know, like a yeah. lot of things, whether you can train well or, or how you feel in training or how long the training is, it's based on like scientific fact rather than you need to do, you know, my opinion of it rather than guessing at it. It was to run game, isn't it? It was, <laughs> it was Nigel Woods' job. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I've, I've gone to. Uh, university now and uh, to get myself an eye education because I want to be involved in management, sports management uh, and working TV stuff uh, on the Super League show. We'll mention it again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so well trained. Uh, yeah. He's on the first show. So, you know, months. yeah, there's a couple of things that I, I want to do and that's, um, that's where I want to go in the game. I don't want to be a coach, right, because you have a three-year contract as a coach, right, but you're only ever on a six-week one because if you lose six games in a row, you're out of there, so... <laughs> I want a bit more stability in my life than that, and uh, I want, um, yeah, so that's where I want to go. I've been fortunate to add a lot of things to my bow. You know, I mentioned uh, Lee's Met University, I did a degree there, for, uh, graduated in 2007. And actually, when we talk about walking up to get Challenge Cup <coughs> and Grand Final medals, that was up there with that, you know, going up and getting the uh, shake in the hand in all the kit. Uh, fantastic experience. Done a lot of stuff with the uh, Leeds Rugby Foundation. I love the work that they do in the community, and as I said, not just as a, a rugby player, but as a dad, I see the value in what they do. So trying out there, out there, um, started doing a little bit of television stuff. Not quite at BBC, you know, you've seen Made in Leeds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've done the Super League show. I, I profile channel there, that we've been starting on. Um, I've been writing a few columns, and, and you know, I spoke to Gary Everton, and he, he said you know, there'll be some up there uh, for me when I finish playing. The, the thing I enjoy most is uh, the coaching. I know JP said, JP said he didn't bother, he's not so bothered, but um, I've coached since I was 18 years old. Uh, I started back at Stanley, I did scholarships, uh, service area. At one point I was coaching every single night and Saturday, Sunday, when I was young before I had my boys. Um, and then I did under 16s at Leeds for three years. So Brad Singleton, Stephen Ward, coach all them when they're coming through. And that is the most gratifying thing outside of playing. So if you work on something all week and you see a young kid go and put on a, a new pass that he's practised or a, the team put on a great move, it's almost as good as scoring a try when you're playing. And I, and I love the interaction with the, the young boys and, and seeing them come through and giving back. So you know, for me, I'd love to do a bit of the youth development stuff when I finish. Well, they've got a game at the weekend. <laughs> a, a small matter of testimonials. If anyone wants to buy a ticket, they are still available. Um, if you get any more inspirational journeys that are more inspirational than these two, in these Carnegie conversations, you've done pretty well. Thank you to Jamie Peacock and Jamie Jones. <laughs>